Well, here's my attempt at answering some of the questions from our live sessions on neurology, uh, on localization in neurology. Uh, I have grouped the questions uh, that we have received into certain groups, so I'm going to try to address one group at a time. So let me look at the questions that we received discussing the different aspects of cranial nerves involvement. Um, so first few questions are related to the facial nerve or seventh nerve. Uh, the questions include, uh, tell us about facial nerve and Bell's palsy, how to manage Bell's palsy, uh, patient with facial weakness, how we will localize upper motor versus lower motor neuron lesion, is Bell's palsy cause of something malignant or can manage as idiopathic? Uh, is nerve to stapedius affected along with the facial nerve and is treatment of idiopathic Bell's palsy have to prescribe corticosteroids or just supportive treatment? So a lot of questions related to Bell's palsy and facial nerve. So the facial nerve uh, nucleus is at the junction of uh, uh, pons and medulla. Uh, the facial nerve comes out along with the eighth nerve it enters the uh, internal uh, acoustic meatus along with the eighth nerve and then goes into facial canal, which is a bony canal. So it basically runs across the bone. So it has to make a tunnel through the bone to come out into the uh, face region. Uh, so it can um, um, uh, supply the uh, sensations uh, that it needs to supply and facial muscles that it needs to supply. Actually, the taste sensation the facial nerve is involved with uh, are just uh, carriers. So there, these are the facial uh, fibers of the autonomic nervous system that join the facial nerve and then separate out as a branch cord or tympani, which is called. So the facial nucleus itself has nothing to do with the taste and it's just a motor nucleus and is basically the facial control of facial muscles. So the upper motor nu neuron lesion will be any damage that involves the control of uh, facial nucleus from the rest of the brain. So anything above facial nucleus is upper motor neuron damage to that facial uh, muscles control. And the facial uh, lower motor neuron damage will be facial motor nucleus or any uh, part of facial nerve as it comes out of the brain and goes uh, through the bones and things like that. Uh, how would you differentiate? So that's uh, something that has been um, uh, very useful to us is that the facial motor nerve nucleus uh, is um, uh, controlling the facial muscles in kind of an organized way. So imagine that nucleus is kind of a tall ball like this. It's the upper part of the nucleus is controlling the upper part of the face and then the lower part here is this one and the lower part here is this one. So the whole face is organized kind of in the facial motor nucleus. Uh, how the, the facial motor nucleus is getting input from the top of the brain through the internal capsule from the cerebral cortex uh, coming down through the internal capsule and controlling the facial motor nerve nucleus. If you get a damage in those fibers that comes down to facial motor nucleus, the facial motor nucleus stops functioning normally. It gets a dysfunction, which will mean that the facial muscles, which are always under tension, because of the facial motor nucleus working, um, relax and the face kind of droops and becomes weaker. So this is an active position, the current facial gestures and a passive weakness or a completely relaxed face without any uh, tension in the muscles will be a complete droop and melted face, a completely droopy face. Um, the, however, facial motor nerve nucleus um, is getting input in, in ways so that the upper half of the nucleus, which controls the upper half of the face, is not affected fully um, compared to uh, the lower half of the nucleus when the control from above is gone. So when the control from above is gone, the lower half of the nucleus loses function a lot more than the upper half of the face. I still think that even the lower motor, lower half of the nucleus is not fully dysfunctional. So a lower motor neuron uh, weakness affecting the lower face, where the full seventh nerve is completely gone, is much worse than the stroke uh, above the facial motor nucleus or upper motor neuron type of weakness controlling the face. So meaning that, yes, the dysfunction is more in the lower half of the nucleus compared to upper half of the nucleus, but it's still not as bad as completely losing the nucleus. But that's, that's kind of the difference. So if you see the face and you see that the upper face looks better than the lower face, so there is still some 
movements in the upper face and there's nothing in the lower face or lower face much worse mild weak you know minimal movement compared to upper face so if there is a difference between the two half of the face then you can tell it's the facial motor neuron nucleus and the nerve is intact and the control from the top is gone that's upper motor neuron uh weakness it's usually is not a cut off you cannot say okay right at this point is where the upper side is normal and lower side is abnormal number 1 it's a kind of a gradient so the strength is better getting worse 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 and worse as you come down the face and number 2 the upper face is often not completely normal so if you compare to the two sides one side the normal side would look better than the other side but is much better than the lower face so it's kind of a gradient involvement where less weakness up there and more weakness down here in the upper motor neuron type of facial nerve weakness in the lower motor neuron type of facial nerve weakness when the motor nucleus or the nerve is damaged then the weakness is equal in upper and lower part of the face there is no gradient and is usually worse than what would you see from the upper motor neuron but you know that's more of a subjective thing the damage lower motor neuron type of damage has many different etiologies but one of the most common reason that you will see a lower motor neuron type of facial weakness is what is called bell's palsy bell's palsy is um a weakness of the nerve due to swelling of the nerve inside the bony tunnel the tunnel does not have a lot of space or room to grow so if the nerve becomes swollen and it presses against the water presses against the the bone which is very strong and rigid then the nerves get compressed uh it's like bone squeezing in it's just that the nerve is getting bigger and that squeeze leads to a uh, dysfunction of the neuron axons that are running down to the face and that is what is called bell's palsy it's presumed to be a viral infection the actual viruses have never been cultured from a bell's palsy because nobody died with bell's palsy you cannot culture it and you cannot biopsy in the bone with the seventh nerve uh, however there are some studies that shows that the dna of herpes simplex virus or hsv was found uh, later on uh, fragments suggesting maybe you know there was a herpes simplex virus infection uh, causing this kind of a viral inflammation uh, the reason we believe it's viral is because it goes away so if you just wait uh, uh, the the inflammation is gone in 5 to 10 days the nerve swelling goes away however the functional the dysfunctional axons uh have to come back more gradually and especially if the swelling was really bad then the healing is slower because some of the axons may have died and they have to regrow so if they're damaged right there in the bone then the rest of the axon slowly dies off and the this previous axon the healthy side has to regrow all the way and we know the axons grow very slowly i think it's 1 to 3 mm uh, a day or or a week or something like that uh, i don't remember it very well um so that tells you that the healing will be much slower if the weakness in the beginning was really bad so worse the weakness the longer it takes for recovery number 2 the faster the onset the more quickly the the he bell's palsy set in the longer the healing and number 3 the more severe the weakness the more chance there is that the healing may not be complete some of the axons may never be able to regrow why because the axons have a sheath that covers them so it's like a pipe around the axon and axons only can find their way back to their target if the sheath is still there if they can find that sheath to get into and they can grow all the way back down to where they need to go however the sheath may not always be present or some axon may not be able to find the sheath even if that was there and that's why some of the axons may never reach back and that can lead some weakness uh, and the chance is that worse with worse the weakness uh we typically treat bell's palsy as idiopathic disease uh most uh, physicians think that the bell's palsy does not need a workup however bell's palsy uh can be mimicked by some other things uh like a rapidly growing tumor affecting the seventh nerve at the cerebrospontine angle like a tiny stroke right at the seventh nerve motor nucleus affecting the, only the motor nucleus because everything else should be fine uh, otherwise you can tell it's a stroke and uh and a multiple sclerosis ms lesion right at the seventh nerve have been described in cases so experts uh you know like specialists or or special some you know neurologists who don't like missing things uh someone like me often end up doing mri of the brain uh 
with thin slices through the brain stem because that's where you're looking for any lesion. The lesion has to be small enough to only affect the seventh nerve and not any of the symptoms uh, for it to be in the brain. Uh, but, you know, most people think that it's not necessary uh, to do any imaging unless patient has some atypical findings uh, and you just treat. The treatment is steroids to reduce the inflammation. Uh, what steroids do, does is that it shortens the duration of swelling and speeds up the recovery. Because remember, the longer the duration, the longer, the worse is the recovery, uh, the worse the disease, the worse the recovery. There is good data to suggest the earlier you start the, the steroids, the better it is. Because the inflammation starts, the swelling happens, it peaks, and then it gradually goes away. So it was already going away, then giving steroids may not shorten it much more. But if, if it's just starting, then giving steroids may lower the peak lower the severity of Bell's palsy so that better outcome and, and shorten the duration. So the faster you can give steroids, the better it is. Uh, the steroid dose is very simple, one milligram per kilogram of the patient. So patient 60 kilograms, 60 milligram daily, or 80 milligram, 80 kilogram, 80 milligram daily. Usually we don't go above 80, even if the patient's 100, 120, or 140 mil kilogram, if he, if he or she is obese, uh, we typically um, uh, maximum uh, ceiling is at around 80 milligram of the dose. And the dose is tapered down over uh, 10 to 21 days. Uh, depend on the severity, I would use either 10 or 21 days. Uh, and it's lowering every few days. So 80, then 60, then 40, then 30, then 20, 10, and five, you know, every two, three days, whichever we want to use. There is a question about, is there any role of antiviral treatment? There have, you know, back when I was in training, when I was seeing Bell's palsy cases, I don't anymore. Uh, I was uh, I read the literature and up to date said that there was a trial using acyclovir that have failed and there was a trial using velacyclovir which showed that you can shorten the duration of recovery. So uh, if you're going to give an antiviral, you have to give velacyclovir. Velacyclovir is expensive and not always available probably in Pakistan. I don't know if, if, they, if you even have it. Then you could use velacyclovir. Acyclovir has no role in treatment of Bell's palsy. The trials have failed as far as I know. I haven't looked at the literature more recently. So that was my uh, summary of Bell's palsy.